So, you're finally ready to get started on creating Minder Stroll, Stardew of the Last Dive, a Souls-like survival first-person shooter with roguelike mechanics that has a dark, twisted story and is an allegory for depression, while serving as a complex RPG with procedural progression and branching, fine-tuned mechanics for driving, close and long-distance combat, realistic ragdolls, but still not too realistic so that the silly nature of the game will play as a juxtaposition for the grittiness, and of course VR, and maybe throw in some AR so that crossplay will be otherworldly. But each masterpiece needs a solid foundation based on well-informed, thought-out and properly debated decisions, the most important of which being what game engine to use. With the final product in mind, you must consider which aspects define your game and which engine best suits those requirements. Unreal, Unity, Godot, Game Maker or the like all have strengths and weaknesses. There is not one you can proclaim as the be-all and do-all in any kind of scenario. But you know why that is? Because in the end, they all follow some rules set in stone, simply branching from some basic ideas that some randos thought up a while ago. So, obviously, to create that perfect tool, the ideal game engine, it's pretty obvious one has to ignore all the knowledge passed down from the forefathers and start digging their own path, because no great invention has ever come out from an already explored area. So, without further ado, it's about time I get down to the nitty gritty of the matter and begin retelling my adventures in creating a never-before-seen SQL-based game engine, and even managing to get a playable game out of it. I, of course, began by putting the cart before the horse, because I had this idea. Why not play up all the strengths of my approach and make it so you can connect to the database, respectively act in a self-contained manner? Meaning, I wanted to completely separate what was happening in the back with the database and what was presented to the end user, visually, in such a way that someone could literally make a client and connect to the database to play their game, no strings attached, almost. And for this, I began work on the client app, just after I created the most basic template for what the main tables of the database will be. One for environments, meaning data about how the game will be presented, as I also wanted to separate the implementation of the game along with its game loop and how it's displayed, in hopes of allowing higher customization. This environment data covered things like window dimensions, title, uh, target frame rate, and execution status, and a special tool I'll be detailing later on. I also wanted a table for the pixels to be displayed to the user and with which the developer will be working when implementing their games. I made it so a custom function that initializes the game environment also initializes the table with the correct number of pixels, setting their positions on the screen as well as their RGB values. This is also something I spent a great deal on thinking about how I could improve the mechanism surrounding them. Not the table itself, because that's obviously perfect, but I'll also expand on this. Lastly, a table holding records of all the input events submitted to the database, so that a player can actually play the game. I limited this one to key related inputs, mostly because I wanted to keep the nature of the client abstract to the database and vice versa, so events relating to the flow or state of one wouldn't really mean anything to the other. Also because in this case the database is the brain of the operation, giving too much control to the client via diversifying the events one can submit defeats the whole purpose. If a client stops working, well, that's too bad, it's on them. I, as the database, don't need or want to know anything about them. I'll simply respond to what's important for a game loop. Now, with these main tables in place, I moved on to creating the client, but not in any simple-minded manner, of course not. I thought it would be fun, and also would allow for better separation between the database and the client, to create a Python library that handles all the stuff in the back, leaving someone that wants to develop a client app for my game engine to simply follow some basic rules, meaning providing some initialization parameters and subscribing some event handlers, and using some predefined methods to signal input. And finally, focus their minds on how to create the best possible bare-bones window. I don't know how much sense or worth is attributed to this decision, but I simply wanted to see if I can make a proper Python library following a clear goal, with the added effect of simplicity of use for an outsider, something I always value greatly when I find myself in the shoes of a newbie. Also, hey, with this I can allow anyone to come up with their own appropriate implementation depending on the architecture, OS and numerous other variables. 
First off, what I concluded was needed to establish the connection to the database was just the connection URL. All the other information could be retrieved from the database as I made sure that only one environment was running at any given point. Thus, I could simply query for the one active and get all the information I needed based on that. I also made it so you could provide the parameter as a CLI argument or using an init function. Following this, I can access all the information needed to start up the window from a global object. Next, I defined what would be used when communicating with the server through the library. The encompassing structure used has an event type, an optional key code in case the type implies the presence of it, respectively a frame with its associated data, present only for events that have associated data of this kind. The event types I consider to be quit, set frame, key clicked, key pressed, and key released. For the key code I simply use the key symbol so as to have a universal convention, irrespective of the keyboard type and layout. Something I actually hadn't thought of properly properly before. Finally, the frame data is comprised of a matrix of pixel data, each having x, y, and RGB values. I also created some internal methods and tried to approach this as optimally as possible, limiting the number of object creations and other expensive operations throughout the entire lib. Then, to allow developers to handle the influx of events, I created a base event handler class, which can be used to create custom event handlers that can be registered using a method that plays the role of mirror for another one that allows the client app to submit events to the database. Next, I began work on the central point of this library, the thing that binds all the moving parts together and acts as the beating heart of any running client app. The main entry points are two methods, one for initializing and one for stopping the environment execution, both acting with regards to a global variable, which is not exposed to the user, this filtering being done using the init.py file of the module. The class for this, env state, operates as a singleton to ensure a single connection to the database from the client in any possible scenario or edge case a developer may run across. This class both handles events to be transmitted to the database from the client as well as adding event handlers, and also manages a secondary thread that deals with polling for new events from the database to the client. And because threads are always quite the rebellious things, I had to make sure the runnable's execution was handled properly. In the event thread, meaning the one that is handled by the env state object, the main attraction is the run method where, knowing I have a target FPS, I pull for new events, which relate to rendering frames, at an interval of at least 1 over value of FPS, and in case the processing takes less than that fraction, it waits until the allocated time for the task is depleted, so that it won't end up having more FPS than desired, and in each loop iteration, it first pulls for the result of querying the database, which is a small join between the table containing the pixels to be rendered and the currently running environment, so that I reduce to a minimum the number of queries I do on the database, as those are the most expensive operations in this entire thing, giving both information about the current frame and on whether execution should stop or continue. And then it notifies all the registered event handlers about the parsed event. You can also notice a DB Connection Manager class instance there, which is a small utilitary class used throughout the library for easier and unified handling of the connection. To create the lib, I used the setup tools package with which, you guessed it, I set up the library using it tools, namely the setup tool, okay I'll stop, by providing the necessary metadata about the lib and the included packages, as well as the dependencies, namely psychopg2. With this, I could create and install the lib by simply running the following two commands, after which it was as easy as creating a new project, importing the lib and getting started working on the client app, which took little time, effort and lines of code. A trifecta of things I love. The client implementation uses tkinter to render an image to a window, for which the parameters are set after initializing the game environment. I also set up some event handlers to submit events to the database, and finally I created a custom event handler to receive events from the database. Depending on what the event is, I update the rendered image or finish the program execution. I also made a small util class to display an approximate value of the FPS, just to get an idea of how incredibly performant my games are. But with that, the client side of the project is done. Just gotta finish up the rest. To get a rough idea of what I wanted the flow of developing games to look like, I created a shell script that generates a template for a game script. 
like in pretty much all game engines, just that it's a bit more rough around the edges in both approach and presentation. The main entry points are the onInit method, which will be run before initializing the game environment, onInputEvent, which provides the latest event submitted to the game, and on render frame, which, as you might have guessed it, runs each time a frame is to be rendered. I used this as pretty much an implementation versus subs approach, in the game engine declaring empty functions with identical signatures to be overwritten when a game script is loaded into the database. Based on these entry points, I worked my way backwards, starting with the onInit function, which I basically just added as an intermediate step in the start environment function, right after initializing the pixels table. Next, regarding the onInput event, I had it so the function is called inside of a trigger on the input events table, which, as the name suggests, is an action triggered when a certain action is taken on the table, in this case inserting a new event, the data inserted being accessed using the new dot column name syntax. Finally, the on render frame, which, to no one's surprise, took the absolute longest. Why, you may ask? Well, because of a little obscure unmaintained with a too low user base operating system named Windows, and also some silly useless optimizations that definitely nobody uses and everyone would be better off without. And I can say that because my obscure, totally useless use case wouldn't work because of it. For the explanations, the main reason is because rendering frames needs to be done separately from the main database process, as normally all function calls are blocking, meaning no async stuff, threads or parallelism, and so from this rose two possibilities that I was aware of at the time, for another possibility was forged in the midwhile. But going back to the point, the first of these possibilities was creating a dynamic library that would allow managing a thread by exposing methods. Now there were four things that were crucial to this. Threads, the Postgres lib, the C programming language, and Windows. Can you guess which of these caused an unmeasurable amount of pain and trouble making me ultimately abandon it? Well, if you guessed all four, then you're absolutely right. Without going too much into detail, let's say that having different implementations for the threads lib by both the Postgres lib and the default one that comes with a compiler, which by the way is an absolute mess for Windows if you're trying to do something advanced enough without a proper build system, as there is no native support for compiling C or C++, paired with a definitive lack of proper documentation or active forums, was the recipe for disaster that made me almost want to switch to Ubuntu or the like to continue the project, before ultimately deciding to try going for another approach. Approach. This next approach centered less around creating a solution from scratch and more around adapting a present mechanism, or in this case extension, to suit my needs, this being PG Agent, a service that allows scheduling tasks to be run detached from the main process, and what's best, it's a well-established solution so no worries about bugs, memory leaks or unoptimized messes, and for the most part it worked great, aside from a few tweaks to counterbalance the greatness of Windows. To start the execution thread, I would simply have to schedule a task a second or so into the future, so that it takes off almost immediately, with the code to be executed being calling a function that contained an infinite loop that would always call the onRenderFrame method. And to stop the execution, I could simply cancel the job. All sounds great now, doesn't it? Well, here's the kicker. When I would start the job, it all worked perfectly, as in the job started, it called the function containing the infinite loop, which in turn called the onRenderFrame method on each iteration, and this worked if the onRenderFrame method didn't contain any instructions that modified any table. And why is that? Because the server automatically optimizes such processes so that batches of instructions don't get called sequentially, but are instead aggregated when the function execution ends. So, say my loop had 10 iterations where on each iteration I would modify the value in a table's column x to x plus 1, I wouldn't see the effect immediately, aka 1, 2, 3 and so on. Instead, only after the last loop executed, I would see the final result of the column being directly set to 10. And this is a great thing in general, but in my case? Well, let's just say that ideally an infinite loop runs infinitely, and also I want to see the results after each iteration, plus this being a core mechanism of the server meant I couldn't work around or modify it. So. I had to drop this approach on the spot. Such is the life of a creative soul trying to break the boundaries of what is thought to be possible, but after a while it starts to dull, and so I went back to reading around, until I came across a very interesting piece of what some would call religious literature, as it literally brought salvation to my poor soul. I should begin by mentioning that what I'm using to write the SQL functions and all that stuff is a procedural language called PLPGSQL, literally meaning
meaning procedural language for Postgres? Well, the PG Developers Wiki presented itself with a chapter called PL Python. Can you envision my excitement now? It literally allows you to run Python code inside Postgres functions, just that you have to add the PL Python 3 U extension. U standing for unstable, by the way, just FYI, which requires you to have the exact version of Python with which your Postgres version was compiled with. Something simplified tremendously by the application stack builder, which offers the option to install that perfect match for you. You just have to make sure that it's added to the environment path above all other Python paths, so as to ensure it will first look for this one, as search is done from top to bottom by default. But with this, I could simply launch a Python script in a detached manner that calls the render function in an infinite loop, while also making sure it stops automatically when execution is stopped. The path to this script is stored by the environment entry, as I thought it would be better than trying to find it through Postgres, as it would require the Python script to be placed in a specific directory of the Postgres installation otherwise. Finally, I created a primitive for drawing rectangles, to offer more tools to the fortunate game developer that will choose this toolkit as their creational wand. But now, now it is, at last, time to create a game to play, and what better option than the timeless classic Snake. First off, I chose some default values for the cell size, meaning how big a squared unit of measure will be, and I set it as 10 pixels in size, both width and height, and some colors for the snake, the reward, and the background. For the game state, I created a table that only holds a single entry at a time, keeping count of whether the game is running, if the user lost, the current position of the reward, and the snake's velocity on both axes, which can be summed as, with the first item representing the x-axis and the second the y-axis, 1-0 oh, if the snake is going to the right, minus 1 O if it's going to the left, O1 if it's going downwards, and O minus 1 if it's going upwards. This is because the Y axis is upside down due to how pixels are rendered to the screen. Next, to keep track of the snake, I created a table that holds information about each cell, meaning each segment that the snake is comprised of. Each row has an X, Y, and position of the cell in the snake. Think of it as pretty much the index of the segment in the snake if the snake was an array. Now, for the onInit function, I had it so, using a custom function I created, generate a random value in a given interval, with a set step, because, and I want to focus on this, each x and y position in this entire script represent the position of the top left corner of a cell, with the constant size of 10 pixels on both width and length being used to project the full square, and so I want to only generate positions that align with those top left corners of the displayed squares. With two of these random values generated, I can set a position for the reward to initialize the game state with, along with the snake originally comprised of a single cell positioned kinda at the center of the screen. Next, for the onInputEvent method, I first verified it was a key press event type and then started verifying the key code associated. If the user pressed space, it would call a method that would start the game if it was not running, which is true if either the user hadn't played at all or if they lost. As for the direction keys, I went with the classic WASD, making sure to account for both lower and uppercase variants of the ASCII codes. Because because, as said previously, I wanted this to be abstracted away from the keyboard someone is using, and simply updated the velocity values depending on what direction the user submitted as input. Finally, for the meatiest of the meaty parts, I began work on the onRenderFrame method. First, as an early check, if the game state was not running, then don't modify what is displayed on the screen. Next, I had to clear the previous positions of the snake cells. I didn't want to do a full screen wipe, as you often see done with classic graphic interfaces, because oh boy would that be costly, and instead simply drew over them with the color of the background. After this, I would move the snake. This was done in a very human and extremely readable manner, using this handy one-liner that avoids multiple database queries and both accounts for wrapping around the edges of the screen, and updates the snake state by setting the tail's value equal to that of the head, to which the velocity is added, and then shifting all the internal positions by one. So, if you were to imagine the tail as the legs in a human, the head would become the neck, the neck becomes the torso so the torso becomes the legs, and the legs wrap around and become the head. This way you get that nice visual in which the snake's body follows the historical trajectory of the head. As for the make or break conditions, I then checked if either the snake bit itself by joining the snake cell stable with itself on the x and y values, and if any overlap exists, it means he touched himself somewhere inappropriately and therefore it's time to call the cops. And alternatively, I check if the snake took the reward by comparing the x and y values of the snake's head with that of the current reward. If true, I insert a new cell as the tail using the negative value of the current velocity. 
and then generate a new reward. Finally, using these updated values, I draw the snake cells and the reward in their new positions, completing the game. And now, by starting the environment and connecting a client to the database, I can enjoy my creation in all its glory, along with its whopping almost 3 frames per second, which Honestly, not to brag or anything, but I can vouch it definitely has a great personality. But wait, that's not all. What if I said I can take that single client and raise you another? What do you say about that, huh? See, you're starting to fully grasp it now, right? The full potential of this project. It pretty much eliminated the need of all the mumbo jumbo netcode stuff everyone keeps complaining about. With this, multiplayer is as easy as connecting another client to the game. Hell, I may even say it might drive streaming platforms to bankruptcy, as anyone can connect and watch the gameplay in real time. Truly, the mark of a generational discovery, this SQL game engine that is. Now, to pretend for a second that this is a serious project and I wanted to improve it, what I would first look into is optimizing the FPS for obvious reasons. It barely runs at a resolution of 400 by 400. An idea I had was something akin to how video compression works and simply accounting for differences between frames, as that would drastically reduce the amount of data to be read, especially as the resolution grows. Except that this approach means that all clients must be perfectly in sync, because if one loses even a single frame, all subsequent operations will propagate, leading to clients displaying completely different, possibly illogical things, as this approach implies that each frame depends on the sequence of frames before it. But I think I'll leave the experts to solve this one.